All right, I'm officially live. What's up, people? Just gonna give everyone a second to come on. Um, but while we're waiting, I'll introduce myself. My name is Andy Weiss. I am the head instructor for the web development program here at WinCode. Um, I'm a former teacher. Um, so I taught for six years in Miami-Dade County Public Schools. I taught journalism, I taught SAT prep, I taught history, many different things. Um, hey, I see some actual current students in the class who are on Facebook Live right now. Stop uh, being on Facebook Live and practice for your final presentations. But hello, everybody. So at any rate, I'm actually uh, also a former WinCode student. So we're uh, graduating cohort 33 tonight. Um, and I was a member of cohort two, so that was over five years ago. Um, my own story, you know, I'd always sort of thought about uh, learning how to code, never had any experience before, and I'd always thought maybe uh, one summer when I was off teaching, I would head out to California and, and take a coding boot camp. But, you know, the cost just seemed prohibitive when you think about, like, how much it costs to do one of these things, and then also how much it costs to, like, move to California for a summer. Um, so all of which to say, like I saw WinCode one day and I just told myself, you know what, uh, it's kind of meant to be. Um, it's, it's right around the corner from me here in Miami. So I, I jumped and, and the rest is history, right? So um, after I graduated, I worked my way up to becoming the lead engineer at an ed tech startup where I could really marry my like, love for education uh, with the tech that I learned at WinCode. Um, and so I did that for, for four years. And now i am been the head instructor here at WinCode at the web dev program for over a year. So tonight's kind of a, a cool special night for us. It's our pitch night. Um, this is where our, our students present the work that they've been working on in our class for the last 10 weeks. And they've been building final projects for the last uh, about two and a half weeks now. So if, uh, if anyone is uh, anywhere near the CIC, I invite you guys to all come out tonight at 6.30. It's over on 20th Street and 7th Avenue. We have uh, final projects where people can find electrical, electric vehicle charging stations near you. Uh, they can do recipes, learn to invest, find gyms, predict the weather on mountain biking trails, and teach each other lessons. So these are all cool examples of projects that students can build in our program. So I want to talk to you a little bit about the schedule, uh, what it would be like as a WinCode student here. So every day we have both a morning lecture and an afternoon lecture. And in between those two lecture blocks, we have something called stand-ups. And stand-ups is a concept that we borrowed out of, you know, just the programming industry in general. The idea is that everyone has a very brief meeting. In fact, uh, the meeting has to be brief because we make everyone stand up, right? And so the whole idea is you talk about what you're working on and if there are any blockers um, to your learning or if this is industry, it's sort of like, you know, what you're working on. And we help unblock each other really quickly in between the morning lecture block and the afternoon lecture block to make sure that everyone's up to date as much as possible. Um, after the two lecture blocks are over, and you know, there's, I would say roughly there's maybe you know four, four and a half hours of lecture for me on a given day. Um, the afternoon blocks vary from day to day. So on Mondays, generally there's like a weekly coding challenge where we try to assess whatever was taught in the previous week, and it's a good way for me to know, you know, if the students got it or if we need to revisit something on a given day. Um, we have challenges that are intended to sort of mimic uh, the kinds of code challenges that you might get if you're applying for a job. And then we review those code challenges with uh, the various students like on the Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday of the week. So after your lectures are over, on Mondays you do your, your weekly coding challenge and then on the subsequent days, typically what happens is that you're reviewing your submission with an instructor. And then Friday we do something called retrospectives, which is also borrowed from industry where the students can talk about like what went well over the course of the week and any suggestions that they have or things that can be improved. So we try to be super transparent with the daily stand-ups as well as the weekly retrospectives, which are good programming practices out of industry that we, we borrow and we use here at WinCode. Um, you know, there's also in the afternoon blocks, there's often guest lecturers. Students learn about project management and how things are built in an agile way. We do collaboration sessions with the other programs that we have, specifically our UX UI program. And then we give job support and lectures on the various soft skills. And there also are very commonly hackathons or other group activities that are meant for the students to code together on a given topic. Um, and then in the afternoons and evenings, there's homework. And there's TA support uh, until 9 p.m. most nights, and there's weekend projects as well. So in a 10-week uh, cycle, you are sort of expected to commit to uh, a very intense experience, 
but just like exercise is the kind of thing where you get out of it whatever you put into it and we have a very very dedicated crop of students at Wincoat every single time I'm always impressed with the effort that they put forth and I think that the numbers speak for themselves because you know 90 plus percent of our students are funding jobs in industry when they're out of here that's really really nice so I can talk a little bit about sort of like what's taught from week to week uh, the first week is intended to be just an introduction to web development in general and sort of the basic tools of the trade, right? So the first thing they learn is how to work the terminal or the command line of their computers to just sort of uh, have a deeper connection with the internal workings of the machine um, rather than just clicking on things through the graphical user interface. You have to start getting used to typing commands and, and making the machine do what it is that you want. Um, we also talk in the first week about HTML and CSS and here I'm going to borrow a metaphor that a former student of mine uh, made over the years. Um, so shout out to Dixie. Um, so HTML is typically thought of as the nouns, like what are the items that are on the page? And then CSS can be thought of as the adjectives that describes like, oh, like this image is going to be like 300 pixels wide, or this text is going to be big, or this is going to have a red background. Um, and these are just sort of the basics of like the static web, right? Like when you're building a web page, whether it's for a small business or, or you just want to communicate some information to the world, typically what you're doing is, do, is you're, you're presenting that information through HTML and CSS. Now this is information that's covered in our pre-work. Um, so a lot of it is technically a review, but we do move very quickly in this course. And so it's really helpful to have seen this information before. Um, I think, honestly, the number one predictor of success in our program is how much uh, the pre-work that a student has completed and how diligently they did that work. And so we, um, we, we, just, we, we really want to hammer home the idea that um, even though this stuff is basic and you've probably seen it before, um, if you have a strong foundation of it early in the, in the cohort, it puts you in a great position to be successful later in the cohort. Um, so weeks two and three are dedicated to JavaScript, which is sort of the third uh, like leg of this stool if you're thinking about what's necessary to build an interactive web page. Um, so to follow on Dixie's metaphor, if HTML are the nouns and the things that are on the page and CSS are the adjectives that describe how they should look, JavaScript are basically the verbs that, that give you interactivity. So when a user clicks some button, something should happen. When a user submits a form, some, there should be some sort of response. Um, if a user is like typing in a search bar, the result should filter in some way. All this is generally speaking uh, achieved through JavaScript. And so we have to get early in the process acquainted with the fundamentals of the language. So things like data types, what's a string, what's a number, what's an object, things like control flow, you've probably heard of like if else statements or loops and functions. I, I call this basically like eating your vegetables, right? Like you need to uh, just get acquainted with the tools of the trade. Um, it's not really fun necessarily, but you need to know it in order to build cool things later. Um, it's it, In many ways, it's similar to what's taught in Codecademy, but we have a lot of students who come to our program who've done Codecademy before, and they say that like they find themselves mired in these very fundamental lessons of like, you know, if else and strings and numbers. They don't understand why it is that they're learning these things. And that's what we try to build upon, and that's what we try to deliver in the in-person bootcamp experience. So as much as possible when we're teaching you about like what is an object or what is an array, we try to pair it with some project-based learning so you can see how these things are directly applied to making a web page interactive very early in the process. So you don't get frustrated just sort of completing exercises independently in a vacuum, not understanding how they fit into the bigger picture. So in week three, uh, we take JavaScript um, and we, we keep practicing how it, we would manipulate items in a web page, how we manipulate the DOM, how we build interactions into a website, but we also uh, add to this uh, JavaScript on the back end as well so that you can see uh, how to have a, a, how to build an API. And so I, I guess I should probably define what an API is. An API is some, some data set that you as the programmer are storing on the back end so that if a user visits your site more than once, uh, they have like a, a customized experience that sort of speaks to however they interacted with the web page in the past, right? Um, so we're not just uh, teaching you how to move elements around on a page, although we certainly do do that and we keep making every single week more complicated, more robust interactions in the web page. But we'll also show you early on how you can sort of have this full stack experience because a lot of our, a lot of our uh, graduates will go on to do JavaScript in the back end and we want them to be familiar with the tools of the trade, how to build server-side APIs with Express and how to store data um, inside of a web app. We used to do a lot of this with a library called jQuery. 
For many years, it was very, very popular, um, but we really do make an effort to stay current with the trends in the industry. And so we want our students to have a really strong experience with the fundamentals of JavaScript so that when they go on to use the more cutting edge, more modern libraries like React, they understand sort of how, at the end of the day, what they're writing is just JavaScript. And so we've, we've excised jQuery from the curriculum in an effort to stay up to date with trends. And it's really awesome that we get to develop our own curriculum here at WinCode, and we can do it like in tight collaboration with our hiring partners, and they can tell us what they're using every day, and we can try to build a curriculum that better prepares them for industry. So you know, after two weeks of sort of learning basic JavaScript things, we start moving into React, which as I said, is like far and away the most popular library for building user interfaces in 2019. React was originally developed by Facebook. Uh, you know, for a number of years, there was a lot of divergence in the front-end ecosystem, right? So, you know, you would have many pages were built in jQuery, many pages were built in Angular, other pages were built in React, other pages were built with Angular JS or Ember or any number of a very a host of popular libraries. In the last year or two, we've really seen a convergence around React and we've really gone all in in this direction where we teach vanilla JavaScript as sort of the basis of the JavaScript curriculum. And then we move directly into React, which is the most popular library, right? Um, React is moving very, very quickly. Um, in the last six months alone, there have been a ton of new features that have been introduced into React. Things like hooks, things like content, context rather, and suspense. And so like, we're really proud that we're making real efforts to stay up to date with this information. In fact, I'll be teaching an event here for alumni of our program on June 26, where we'll be unveiling some new material um, that incorporates a lot of these changes that Facebook has made to React. Um, you know, by the end of like weeks four and five, students are managing complicated state interactions um, using React. They're building reusable components and they're just building these like more robust, more complicated uh, applications that rely very often on third party APIs for data. So as I said before, um, you know, basically an API is some third party data set that programmers open up so that our developers can build on top of them. And so for their midterm projects, students are usually able to build things like a clone of maybe like the, uh, the Internet Movie Database or Yelp or, or really any site where a user can sort of like search for information, find what they're looking for, and then drill down further for more information. And this is always built with some combination of React on the front end and then these third party APIs or these third party data sets. Uh, that sort of substitute for a backend because the students haven't learned like really, really deep backend programming just yet. So the midterm project is sort of the capstone for their experience as front end programmers. So by week six, we start the second half of the program and this is where they start to learn those backend technologies. Uh, they learn their second programming language, which is Ruby. Uh, Ruby was developed by uh, a guy named Matz in Japan, and he designed this language with intention to what he says, uh, you know, make programmers happy or maximize developer happiness. So at every turn when he was developing this language, he was faced with the decision of whether he would do it in a way that would be easier for the programmer, for the human writing the code, or for the machine that has to digest and then execute that code. And at every turn, he, did the, the, he made the choice that was easier for the human because he really wanted the developers to have an optimal experience working with the, with the Ruby language. And a lot of this is based on the theory that like every single year, computers get smarter and faster, but people don't get smarter and faster every single year. So you really want to optimize your experience for what makes developers more productive. Um, you know, developer salaries are usually the biggest expense for any startup. Obviously, as a, as a program that trains developers, we like that developers are expensive because we want our graduates to go out and earn lots of money when they graduate from this program. But anything that makes developers more productive is always good for the company's bottom line, which is why a lot of large companies and startups as well you know, are using Ruby. So Ruby is used by GitHub, which is one of the biggest collaborative uh, you know, code projects in the world, just recently bought by Shopify for you know, you know, billions of dollars. Shopify, one of the largest e-commerce platforms out there, is built on Ruby. And also a lot of our local hiring partners here in, in, in Miami are also using Ruby, often in conjunction with React, which again is like why we sort of developed our curriculum in such a way that responds to the feedback that we get from the market. Ruby is also very similar to Python, and Python is one of like the most popular libraries for doing data science or machine learning. So if you have an interest in those things, uh, we teach Ruby here, but it's very, very similar to Python. Um, they're sort of cousins, and so you can very easily make a transition from one to the other if you have an interest in doing any sort of advanced data science. 
Um, you know, but either way you look at it, we really believe that it's a great idea for students to learn multiple languages, even though they're only here for 10 weeks. You know, languages come and go. There will always be a new popular language on the, on the market. And we want our students to think like programmers in like multiple ways from multiple paradigms rather than just memorizing syntax. We want our students to like have a, a general approach to a problem. If, uh, if all you have is a hammer, then everything looks like a nail, but if you have multiple languages in your tool set, you can choose the right tool for any job that you have in front of you. So after a week of sort of learning the fundamentals of Ruby, we move on to Rails. Now, one of Ruby's greatest strengths is the fact that it is under, underpins the Rails ecosystem. Rails is a very popular framework for building all sorts of web applications, and one place where it really shines as a tool is in interacting with the database. It's an excellent first language and an excellent first framework to learn for anyone who wants to learn more about backend programming. Um, our students learn the basics of like modeling data in the database, and at this point we can basically start to refer to them as full stack developers because they've mastered the front end with HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and React, and now they're learning how to actually store data in a persistent way in a database. They learn how to do user authentication, which allows them to build more complicated apps where they can store information about their users, their users can build user profiles, upload photos to Amazon Web Services, all these sorts of more, more common but like very uh, in-demand and very popular features that any web app is going to need to have to be considered like a modern web app in 2019. In week seven, the students start thinking about their final projects, and basically we have people uh, Per, uh, like work in a process very similar to like a shark tank where you're pitching an idea, we call it win tank, right? And so the students pitch their final project ideas. A lot of times they're working in collaboration with the UI or the UX students, uh, which is the sister program that we have here to our web development program. And then we put them through a process or through an exercise where they have to submit wireframes or like mock-ups for their final project idea. And they also have to submit databases of how they think that the, di sorry, diagrams of how they think that their databases will act because we want them to be working on top of a really solid foundation when they are going deep and then like really working long days and evenings on their final projects um, once they get going. We try to model like all the best practices from industry for, with Git and GitHub, where people have a, a, a very strict workflow where they have to go through, where before you do any work, you have to open an issue, you have to declare what is the code that you're about to write, you make something called a user story, which is very popular in industry. Students have to submit their code via something called a pull request, which is basically you're requesting a more experienced developer to review your code, and you have to make sure that all of your code is well tested before it gets merged into the final project. Um, we're really sticklers about trying to promote these practices out of industry here, even though it's a learning environment, because once our students go out into industry, they often come back to us and they say that these sorts of things are like the most important things that they're learning, and that's a reason that a lot of wind coders are able to move up quickly and get promoted in their jobs in that first year and get higher salaries in years two and three. Um, so basically, this week seven is all about learning how Rails works, learning how to interact with the database, and they're starting to get excited and starting to think about what their final products are going to be and starting to flesh out those ideas. Um, by week eight, we're really getting into like, you know, we're getting close to the end of the curriculum, right? And so uh, we make a real effort to unite what they've been learning on the front end with their HTML and their CSS and their React with the backend stuff that they've been learning with Rails, right? So now instead of interacting with these third-party APIs that are about external data, our students are building their own APIs based on data that they control, and then building these like robust uh, user interactions that, that, that work with the data that they're exposing in their Rails apps. So we do things like you know how to send email through an application, how to do geolocation, how to work with dates and times, which is a very hard problem in computer programming. Often they build these interactive, uh, you know, reactive calendars uh, where the, the page never has to refresh, but they're pulling data from a third, from an API that they built themselves. And then in the afternoon, students are working on their projects. They're consulting with their instructors, and you know. They're working usually very late afternoons and evenings and they're coming in on the weekends and they're working on their final projects. Um, by week nine, we're really transitioning in them into preparing for what comes next, which is that they're gonna have to start interviewing for jobs, right? And so we teach them some of like the fundamentals of object-oriented programming, some concepts that are, are called collectively referred to as solid principles, which are some architectural designs. We teach them about performance, 
Um, and these are all things that we mostly teach them because they're expected of junior developers, often in job interviews. Right? We also go through an exercise called polyglotting, which is where we have them perform a very common interview question, but in five different programming languages, right? And three of which they've never seen before the day that we assign them the project, right? So we teach them Ruby, we teach them JavaScript, and then we expect them to be able to write those same sorts of programs, but in Python, in PHP, in Go, in Elixir, right? So all these other languages that they have never seen before, we want them to have the confidence to be able to apply to jobs that are way outside their comfort zone because we, believe very much in this idea of like never stop learning and that if you can learn Ruby in two weeks, if you can learn JavaScript in two weeks, it only gets easier, right? So like the first foreign language that you learn in human language is always the hardest, but like once you've learned Spanish, you can probably pick up Portuguese or Italian more easily after the fact, right? And so um, we want them to feel confident applying to any of these jobs when they're, when they're done with WinCode. And it's very common, I mean, certainly probably half of our students do find work in Ruby or JavaScript, but an equally large number of those students end up working in languages that are not even the ones that we taught in this course, primarily because we teach the fundamentals of how to think like a developer, and we don't get mired down in the syntax of any one individual language. Um, and it, it's just really awesome to see them go out in the world and study all these different things and get hired into this very wide array of, of, of jobs once they've graduated. Um, so basically, by week 10, they're really, really focused on their final projects. So here we are in, right now, where it's Thursday of week 10, they're gonna make their presentations tonight. The students are usually spending this week like racing to fit whatever final features they can into their final projects. Um, they're practicing their presentation skills. Um, you know, presentation in general, and like talking about your code is a really underrated skill in the programming world. We always have these stereotypes of like programmers who are like locked in a basement somewhere with a can of Mountain Dew and they can't talk to the outside world. But WinCode really stresses that as, 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 as developers, you need to be able to communicate clearly about your code, and we really stress the presentational skills. So students are spending time, again, po polishing their final projects and preparing their presentations that they give in front of like uh, usually hundreds of people at the CIC, which, again, is happening tonight, so you should probably come. Um, 6.30 tonight, come see what our students are doing, see what they've been working on uh, for the last 10 weeks. I think that uh, you'll really, really be impressed. It's over at the CIC on 20th Street and 7th Avenue, and, and it's also paired with the Venture Cafe. Um, for anyone who has not gone to the Venture Cafe before, you should definitely go any Thursday uh, afternoon or evening um, over at the CIC. They have a great networking event, which is awesome for all things uh, tech in Miami or all things uh, entrepreneurship in Miami. It's a great introduction to the ecosystem that we're building here uh, in South Florida. So at any rate, uh, I'd love to see you guys tonight. Um, if you have any questions at all, um, or you know, if there's anything that I can be helpful with, don't hesitate to email me. Uh, I'm Andy Weiss at wincode.co. Or if you have admission specific uh, questions, if you're interested, um, or if you want to take a tour, um, send an email out to admissions at wincode.co, and we'd love to see you here on campus. So um, this has been really fun. It's my first FaceTime Facebook Live. Um, and I uh, hope to do this again. But everyone, have a wonderful day. Hope to see you guys tonight.